All right. Uh, welcome everybody. Now officially that um, the recording is um, is uh, in progress. Thank you so much for attending the live lecture. Thank you for taking the time. And for those that are not uh, able to come today for different reasons, I, I certainly understand. Uh, the recording will be available in the same place than than the others. Uh, of course, uh, we lectures always like to see uh, the active engagement and at least coming coming to the live lectures. But uh, I know that sometimes the conditions are not enough in that um, in that regarding. So a uh, couple of things before that. Uh, I think some of you um, uh, studying the the master on regional uh, development. Um, I've reached to Professor Hansik about about the topic and some issues on the reading list. So I will not explain that very well. I copy the message I received onto the OLAT group, and then um, you are free to uh, to to go there and reach out to Professor Hansik. Uh, and if you have doubts on the on the on the criteria in that in that for that specific seminar of the of for the students on the, on the Master of Regional Development. Uh, Master of Science, uh, Society and Environment and international students, uh, the, everything uh, remains the same as in the previous message. So everything is also at the all at group. And if you have doubts, come back, uh, come back to me. Um, all right, so let's jump on to our fourth lecture and we are progressing uh, uh, quite well. I had to record um, a lecture a complimentary lecture for lecture number three because I was not able to conclude the slides and I found that they will be important. Thank you so much, some of you, for keeping the cameras on. It's always nice to see you all. And um, so the idea also of that complimentary lecture is that allows me to uh, start straight away uh, on the on the two domain main domains of this lecture for and you know that all these issues economic geography, sustainability, they are interlinked. Talking about one, talking about governance certainly entails discussing uh, public policy, environmental policy, uh, economic organization. It involves a number of actors. So everything here is very much interconnected. And our, our task as researchers and your task is to, uh, for example, focus in one domain and try to disentangle all these components and explore um, critical uh, parts of that. So I have now a checklist to avoid issues like before. So it seems that recording is on and the screen is um, is um, is active. So today we will talk about slow innovation and circular economy. It's important to underline these are concepts that can be explored within economic geography in relation to sustainability and environmental aspects in general. Uh, and then many other concepts could have been explored here. These are uh, uh, those that I, I found uh, more interesting for both groups, the, the students on the society and environment and regional development and international students, as these topics are possible to be grasped through case studies worldwide from developed societies to least developed uh, economies or higher income countries and low income countries origins if you will and they are i think also helps to connect the sustainability transitions discourse we talked about earlier and what comes next in terms of corporate responsibility and how uh, firms enterprises the private sector can operate in this context same same organization 40 minutes and 10 minutes break and we'll underline here the two domains of, uh, of the previous lecture on accelerating sustainability transitions, scaling up the sustainability transitions, then we touch upon slow innovation and why we talk about it, and, uh, and also about the circular economy and uh, the extent is leads well with economic geography and sustainability. And I try in one slide bringing together the, the, the what we have discussed earlier on the sustainability sustainability transitions, the importance of exploring sustainability transitions through a geographical lenses. So showing concerns towards the inequality of the sustainability transitions, who plays the role, who benefits the most, uh, 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 understanding that in this play for sustainable development worldwide, uh, this play coming, for example, from the, 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 the COP26, 
of last week and the and the, that 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 and agreement reached on the weekend is important to think about also developing countries and and those that that often play a role in supporting these sustainability transitions in the north such as for example supplying raw material for batteries uh, lithium for example that comes from mining activities in the in the developed societies of southern sub-saharan africa or latin america for example and the slide reveals that to truly address sustainability transitions is important to understand the technical component and this involves innovation it involves innovation with technology, technological developments, and also social components regarding the behavior of ourselves as a consumers, behavior of the entrepreneurs, and this all together happens within a specific geographical context. It involves science and society, engineering, and entails a number of governance challenges to administrate and organize these, um, these sustainability transitions. Also, uh, a slide to summarize the domains of the sustainability. Currently, I'm uh, or uh, also I'm expecting uh, that sustainability transitions um, discourse and uh, policies supporting it will uh, will broaden the domain of applicability. Currently, the sectors are mainly those related with agriculture or food systems, with uh, um, energy and energy transitions using more. Uh, renewable resources wind wind solar power and and others and the transportation sector so these are the domains of the society where uh, sustainability transitions are currently being more intensively uh, explored and the challenge that uh, there are different challenges uh, mainly governance challenges uh, regarding the applicability operationalization, if you will, of the sustainability transitions. And these researchers here uh, uh, encapsulate these issues. Uh, one as being related with the acceleration of sustainability transitions, the importance of, of, of speed, of, of, of uh, making these small innovations, sometimes niche innovation we talked about earlier, of exploring or fulfilling a specific need of the market. Uh, is important to accelerate this so it can start having a higher impact and a wider impact, higher and wider impact on the society and scaling up different solutions towards sustainability transitions. Eventually, uh, I underlined this quite quite intensively earlier, uh, place-based solutions or local-based solutions, sometimes regional solutions, they, they reveal to be very effective in counteracting environmental degradation, for example, and it's important to find ways to scale up, to, to, uh, to help them move from a minor scale, a municipal scale, a local scale to a regional one, and eventually to a to a national one and eventually to an international level. But this takes a lot of time and it, has, it needs to go through different governance arrangements, go, uh, going across, which implies also going across uh, policy levels of decision making. So the danger here of, uh, of the sustainability transitions that yes, we talk uh, a lot about it, uh, there's lots of research going on in different domains, also different policies and, still uh, uh, remains the possibility of uh, doing the same uh, doing business as usual and, and then nothing really changes in this context so is ourselves yourselves as students or, or ourselves as researchers to understanding the number of questions that can hinder the sustainability transitions of really bringing about some change to the system we live in more than society understanding to the the impact that that addressing sustainability will have on changing on reshaping these systems that clearly reveals to uh, have dramatic dr dramatic failures and has, has a higher impact in the uh, environmental degradation, biodiversity loss, um, and uh, ultimately impacts the livelihood of local communities. So it's important to question. So what's happened in terms of uh, sustainability in the developing countries? Or because if calling them developing is already uh, uh, it implies or attached to them a negative component, we may call it low-income countries. Uh, how we they, they can also uh, 
embrace this uh, embrace these sustainability transitions how can jump into the train of the sustainability transitions understanding who benefits from the sustainability transitions and understanding that this the, the this 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 transition always involves a give and a take to reach a certain level of efficiency of energy efficiency is necessary to to negotiate eventually is necessary to to uh, uh, explore the mining activities that are essential for example for battery production for bicycles or for electric cars uh, it's important to understand that all everything involves a give and a take and i don't know if you are aware of the one of the final discussions from the COP 2016, uh, 26, 26 in Glasgow about uh, a minor, uh, which is not that minor actually, uh, a, a simple change in the world from phasing out to phasing down of the coal uh, mining activities. So now the wording is more um, uh, phasing down instead of phasing out. And uh, in this complimentary lecture, I talk about this phasing out that's underlined and also by by some of these researchers. So to su truly support sustainability transitions is, is necessary to 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 truly stop uh, uh, coal ex uh, uh, exploration and uh, to truly stop using uh, coal. So when we enter this phasing out when, when uh, of certain resource is important to compensate the negative impacts that of the closure of mining activities will have on some local economies. So it's important to counteract the negative aspects and find the right balance uh, uh, supporting this transition is not so we we cannot fully and blindly blindly accept uh, a sustainability uh, a sustainability transition and telling okay now all the mining activities uh, need to be closed otherwise we'll not be able to to reach the target uh, in terms of um, uh, the climate targets but okay and then what's happened to these local communities uh, in low-income countries without having any other uh, uh, possibilities of benefiting from um, economic development or they don't have any economic development prospect is important to find the right balance in terms of uh, the sustainability transitions and some of the research uh, research currently ongoing they point out ways of uh, addressing some of these challenges and here I bring together different uh, insights on the scaling up solutions. So they tell that it's important to find lasting collaborations. So, so think in terms of long term. And um, sometimes to support these lasting collaborations, it is necessary to design new institutions. Maybe the current governance arrangements are simply not enough. Having, uh, I don't know, let's say, example, having a national state even divided in autonomous regions as, as in Spain or, or, or in Italy or in the States as in Austria or in Germany. Maybe this is, these institutions are not enough. It's important to, to find ways on how to facilitate these collaborations. This implies sometimes designing new institutions, maybe bringing informal arrangements and informal institutions together to support these, these transitions. So it's necessary to find the right mechanisms to sustain these collaborations or these engagements um, and it, uh, another lesson is to involve the private sectors it's important to 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 uh, to uh, that they are on board in terms of the sustainability transitions and what it entails it's important that the private sector uh, shares this uh, this common goal of improving the quality of life counteracting deforestation and negative impacts of deforestation on the on the climate is important to to bring them on board on the issues that continue that maintaining the current economic system will uh, will uh, will entail and also it's important to rely on the some sometimes goodwill of the entrepreneurs or or uh, somehow uh, educating them uh, voluntary of course not forcefully uh, to embrace a green transition to 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 uh, uh, to try to influence them uh, to incorporate more sustainable ways of production or distribution uh, involving that uh, than uh, than in industry to achieve this is important to involve different types of expertises that's the lesson number five so these are all steps to 
to truly scale up these um, these um, sustainability transitions, um, and some of them they go a bit a bit um, forward. Uh, some of the researchers go a bit, a bit more forward in how they they put the word out there. And in this case, Lamba Eric Lamba calls that the use of shame to disrupt to disrupt this business as usual is very interesting. We know sometimes. We'll talk about this next lecture. We have the corporate social responsibility. So the companies, enterprises, firms, if you will, they, they have their corporate uh, social responsibility programs targeting society. And they now have corporate environmental responsibility targeting mainly the environment, the ecological domain, trying to reduce their environmental footprint. So here in this lesson number seven, the tell that is important to shame those that are not following this sustainability pattern. Okay, this is certainly interesting and it's very difficult to, uh, to to evaluate how this using of shame is, is going. And it's also important to understand, okay, maybe they are not following now uh, the, the more sustainable manners of contracting their activity, uh, economic activity. Why? What are the reasons? Maybe lack of resources. Maybe the maybe the, the policy, the public policy from the territory where they are located still is lagging behind in, in, in terms of, of this sustainability transition. So it's important to understand a number of governance aspects. Of course, not neglecting the developing countries in this in this transition, so the number of ways on how to scale up these um, these solutions, and uh, the diagram shows uh, or pinpoints here the importance of governance. And when we are talking about scaling up solutions towards the sustainability, is important to bring public sector and the private sector and the semi-public sector, NGOs, environment NGOs, grassroots movements from the from the society, to support these sustainability transitions. In all of this implies an integration of policies, integration and cooperation across sectors and across administrative boundaries um, as well. And uh, another aspect that is important to be addressed to truly embrace uh, sustainability is through innovation and innovation policies. Uh, and in this regard, that's when we start building uh, here a lecture towards the topic we'll discuss, that is slow innovation, among many other possibilities of exploring innovation and how uh, consumer behavior and other aspects of more corporate governance entail uh, or contribute to address the sustainability transitions challenges. And before I start uh, uh, the discussion on the slow innovation process, which actually uh, raise a, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of interest last year among among your colleagues uh, do you have any questions regarding these sustainability transitions the governance aspects why it is important in economic geography uh, understanding sustainability transitions do you have any question in this regarding So feel free to, to drop any time via, 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 via chat if you don't want to come through voice or, uh, or, um, or, um, or later on if something is, uh, is uh, not uh, clear enough for your, um, for, your, uh, um, for your thoughts or in your thoughts and for your uh, uh, perception of, this, of the topics we are discussing. So I mentioned, so there are different ways of accelerating this, uh, try or support this scaling up and acceleration of sustainability transitions. One of them is through innovation policies. And there are a number of innovation policies and uh, probably you are familiar with some of them, mainly, mainly those uh, supported through the European Union in terms of uh, in terms of uh, territorial development, uh, regional uh, regional policies, for example, most of them intended to support innovation processes uh, within traditional sectors of activity, textile, uh, and the automobile sector, quite rooted within the European economy uh, in Central Europe, textile in the southern part of Europe. Another component uh, is how 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 to deal with this innovation. So an innovation tends to be associated with urbanized territories. However, a number of researchers, and I point some of them in these slides and uh, 
and I shared with you uh, the three main uh, ref three main references covering the, the lecture today. So they start underlying that the non-urbanized regions, non-urbanized territories, they also play a role in innovation. And, uh, and basically this idea of slow innovation emerged aligned with the uh, emergence of the slow movement, which is basically an opposition to the fast movement of the current a neoliberalized economic system where fast is about busy, controlling, aggressive, responding to the market, putting, dropping products uh, uh, in the in, in the shops uh, while ahead of the standard time. We probably already start seeing in the beginning of November a lot of Christmassy across our uh, across the shopping malls and the shops two months ahead of the of that time. So everything within this philosophy of fast processes of economic growth and, uh, and innovation follows this train of, um, uh, tends to follow this fast, uh, fast philosophical principle of the economic system. On another, somehow as a counteracting measure to this fast process, the slow movement emerged as trying to underline a more, a more receptive, in, intuitive approach, relying on, on the rooted knowledge, on the, what, we, what the researchers call last decay knowledge, or a knowledge that lasts longer. And how, but then the question was how to use this knowledge that, that lasts longer, that tends to emphasize quality, tends to emphasize local resources and uh, we have been underlining this earlier, how important it is to underline local solutions and using local resources, minimizing the impact of globalized supply chains, for example. So this starts to be developed conceptually and in practical terms by a number of uh, a number of researchers. Uh, here, the, the, but the idea before going to that is important that to understand, yes, the, the current organization of the society relies very much on the fast and the fast uh, uh, and the fast to occur needs uh, proximity and the proximity exists in urban spaces, in more urbanized spaces. This led to a number of rural areas start lagging behind in terms of economic development. They start losing population because they were moving to more urban place, urbanized territories, urbanized places with a higher, higher number uh, quantitative and qualitatively in terms of job uh, job offer, so this start uh, this led to uh, 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 to imbalances and a number of regional uh, equalities. And this is applied uh, in general in the, in the in the general economic organization of these territories, but also in terms of the development of technology and innovation processes in support of this of this uh, technology of these technologies. Um, so, but uh, also a part of this discourse in support of the slow innovation is that, okay, innovation needs to occur in a way that it does not only support economic development, this fast process, but is also good for the planet and people. So how to, uh, to keep investing in technological developments, in, in innovation, innovation, innovating production processes, innovating in terms of technology, making them more research efficient, for example, uh, how to use this, this innovation to, to, to help uh, the planet and the people living uh, reach a higher standards in terms of living, uh, entering a, a, a process of development with a, by minimizing a f uh, ecological footprint, for example. So instead of finding these quick fixes or applying one size fitting all innovation approaches, you know that this, this uh, innovation policy that is uh, applied everywhere without uh, looking specifically to the to the needs of that that place, that territory, or the resources they have at hand. So how to counteract this fast, one-size-fitting-all process and then slow innovation start emerging uh, 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 within, start emerging within, within economic geography research that typically focus on innovation processes in urban context. So the, the prime assumption, and, and that this is something that's uh, that is kind of is a take home message from the lessons is that the, 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 the common assumption is that innovation to occur 
uh, uh, needs an urbanized territory. So what, how these researchers put it, innovation is essentially an urban phenomenon. So uh, a few research uh, uh, exist, or, or yeah, it's still few. Research, there are a number of gaps underlining that innovation also occurs in non-urbanized territories, because urbanized territories they rely very much on proximity. So different actors from the private sector, from the service, from the industry, they are uh, located in the same urbanized territory. They 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 are close together, so they have facilities to to meet. To, to reach uh, some agreements, to help to improve some practices, some process. So somehow innovation organically occurs where proximity exists. So they are close to each other. This favors knowledge exchange and favors an innovation process. So, and a number of indicators led uh, 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 support this this assumption that innovation is essentially an urban phenomenon. The number of uh, patents registered, for example, they are mostly uh, coming from urbanized uh, or large cities um, or large metropolitan areas, and uh, and uh, um, that uh, that that the fact that this. Uh, offers offers in terms of uh, uh, job offers being located in the city in the cities more related with uh, creative services they start leading to to uh, some sort of branding of these metropolitan areas as a creative cities and somehow then that, that these these urbanized territories entering a, a, a snowball process where a smaller innovation led to a higher innovation and then they start attracting more and more people uh, to to their um, urbanized to their urbanized territories another branch of research that evolved along uh, evolved evolved along the, the other line of research primarily focus on understanding innovation processes in an urban context, start to analyze or to focus more on how these more um, uh, territory, territories, not necessarily rural, but in the surrounding areas of uh, core urban areas, can also contribute to these innovation policies. And so a number of research start to explore to what extent these these known urban geographers can also play a role in innovation processes. And Hank Meyer, for example, currently affiliated with the University of Bern in Switzerland, start to exploring the process of slow, uh, slow innovation in rural territories in countries that uh, where the, the level of innovation is essentially attached to urban areas. And they start, uh, together with others, they start to exploring uh, how these small territories, these, these peripheral territories can also contribute to innovation process that, that per se can support the overall development of an, a region. And then the region will have an urban, an urban geography and a rural, a rural geography. Um, let me just underline, see if I forgot something. Yeah, precisely that, that they, they start to exploring and argue in favor that innovation uh, can also occur in these, uh, in these rural territories. And uh, there are a number of examples in this regarding where some of the traditional sectors, for example, the textile or shoemaking, they start exploring uh, by relying very much on the on their social and cognitive proximity. So. So, so uh, counteracting or, or contraposing the, the, the mainstream research underlying the importance of proximity in urban areas, another branch of research emerging to underline the cognitive proximity, sometimes cultural attachments that exist in these smaller places, in these non-urbanized areas, and how their knowledge can last longer in comparison to the fast process of innovation within urban territories. And it starts also being explored, they extend this lasting longer knowledge, uh, these social ties that exist in smaller territories are uh, fundamental to support uh, innovation that is environmental friendly and then can support the sustainability. And this involves more the, the use of, of uh, it requires also a transition within industrial activity that relies more on lasting longer products and to reach to truly develop these lasting longer products that are that more that are more resource efficient efficient they they uh, they they also require a change in terms of of uh, uh, 
innovation policies and how funding supporting these innovation policies is distributed. So researchers, uh, they tend to, to also uh, respond to how policies are being developed, but also research can also influence the way policies are then created, uh, we call policy making process and then implemented. So a number of, uh, for example, and mainly uh, European Union programs that touch, touching upon place-based innovation policies start to emerging as response to uh, a higher to higher research underlying that innovation also occurs in known urbanized territories. Um, hopefully that I'm uh, uh, reaching uh, out in the, in, the, in the clear manner. And some of these non-urbanized territories, so-called peripheral territories, or small and medium-sized towns. Uh, so they have been indeed overlooked in the, in, within the urban and economic geography literature. And they are start, they, they research start paying more attention to how they can uh, play a role in um, play a role in, the, in in supporting in supporting economic development not only of the smaller communities but also contribute to the to the development of a larger urban region and some of them they tell okay these smaller uh, lagging regions uh, rural rural territories peripheral territories different ways of addressing them uh, some of the researchers start to to focus more on how we can emphasize their potential, their features, their, their amenities, uh, and, and the extent that innovation policies can also target them because they still matter to support uh, a, a cohesive development of the territories in general. So the idea here is that indeed, okay, having innovation policy in an urbanized territory is fundamental in terms of, for example, employment. And uh, uh, a number of firms, they come together to, the, to, to support a technological development. This has been commonly researched within economic geography. Then, then other geographies more concerned with the social sustainability domain, they start becoming concerned with it, that this is exploring this urbanized innovation process in urbanized landscapes is contributing to uh, regional inequality. However, these smaller territories, these peripheral regions, they can also play a role in supporting an overarching economic development and the, the cohesive development of the territory. So a number of policies starting to emerge, uh, targeting mainly these lagging regions and small and medium-sized towns, mainly intended to support innovation processes that help them to capitalize their potential, that capital that help them to capitalize tacit knowledge, uh, the knowledge they, uh, the, what uh, are processes they are very familiar uh, in, in dealing in, the, in, everyday, in everyday context. And these are mostly related, related with agriculture developments and traditional industrial activities involving textile and, um, Garment industry in general, or components in support of more uh, uh, of uh, production production of components supporting traditional traditional activities, the, and this research has been conducted across uh, across Europe, from uh, English speaking countries to uh, to non English speaking countries, which I also underline here the importance of also uh, of us researchers focus on the on the literature produced by known uh, English speaking countries they often have a more localized approach to the reality although not not writing not not communicating their findings in English they are still very relevant for us researchers to understand phenomena and also to support to support policy making so the large the big difference between the fast movement of the economic system and the slow movement uh, is essentially asset specific so various local assets uh, pays attention to grassroots tends to be more sustainable because the products uh, developed the idea is that they last long so so they do not uh, and first they not re they they are they do not respond to the market needs, but the idea is that producing some 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 product that can last longer in terms of time in different contexts and is very sensitive to local history as opposed to less sensitive approach to local history from the fast movement. 
And in support of the slow innovation process, another movement starts to emerge. And maybe some of you are familiar with this slow food concept, uh, uh, slow city uh, concept as, as well. And altogether, they emphasize very much uh, community economic, uh, economic development. I underline here, this aligns with what we have been discussing earlier on territorial governance, a governance that underlines formal and informal arrangements. So pays attention to the, the importance of, uh, of uh, involving grassroots movements, the citizens. And how to reach these alternative uh, economic, uh, these alternative uh, innovation approach requires an evolution through time. It certainly for it to become mainstream or maybe we don't really want it to become mainstream, but to the point of, of being influential, it requires time and it's important to understand how this process evolves through time and very much underlines the local values. That's the essence of this slow innovation uh, process. And the research currently uh, conducted within slow innovation focus on specific on specific economic activities, being these mainly related with uh, with the garments industry or the tech, traditional textile textile sector. So, and they underline that these slow innovators, we can also call them slow entrepreneurs, they interact with less frequency in comparison to the fast innovators, those located in the in urbanized territories, and they rely on slow JK information and knowledge. So, is the a knowledge that that tends to 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 be less a reaction to trends but more uh, uh, it relies more on on know how um, on how to deal with certain certain raw materials and how to transform these raw materials in final products so relies more on the on the consolidated knowledge instead of a reactionary knowledge that reacts to trends most of them spread throughout uh, social media for example uh, and some some of these res uh, 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 res uh, researchers underline that yes, okay, to, to truly respond to the market needs, these designers, these uh, fast innovators, fast entrepreneurs, they need to be located in an urbanized territory. This urbanized territory offers other facilities for them to 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 bring their ideas to the market. So the designers start being located in these major urban areas. Um, but this this also this, this tendency evolved with the shape of the minds of also of these fast innovators as they start acknowledging that other ways of of uh, 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 of economic development are also possible and they do not really need to be located in an urban in an urban area as these peripheral areas start also evolving and offering the conditions for them to be to to explore to explore their ideas by using and by focus essentially on the local resources. So let's start, start different phenomena being reshaped also through uh, uh, changes in terms of, uh, of behavior. It's still, I'll uh, this slow innovation process has been uh, uh, influencing, uh, is influencing the garment and the fashion industry in general. Uh, fashion is still very uh, irresponsible in terms of social, uh, and environmental sustainability, and it depends depends the context, the geographical context. You are analyzing them. Some of them uh, they 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 are uh, socially unsustainable because of their the way they deal with the labor force, and others are unsustainable because uh, instead of of uh, uh, putting their products in the market to 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 uh, to uh, to satisfy to satisfy specific specific needs when it comes to the loss of profit for example they they tend to destroy their production instead of of fulfilling a market in, instead of putting them into the market so the it the process of fast innovation which is associated with the fast production and consumption is very much attached to the fashion uh, industry and to reshape this fashion industry in a way that becomes more sustainable, it certainly will take an effort from all of us as a consumers, uh, and will take will require a policy, public policy interventions, and certainly the engagement of the private sector in understanding that the way forward is not through a fast fashion process, but a slower one that relies more on long lasting long products. 
a number of organizations through again governance arrangements they have come together to to support uh, a transition towards sustainability within the fashion industry and then um, I, uh, while preparing this lecture, I came across of this uh, charter of uh, fast uh, uh, fashion industry approved uh, uh, earlier this month. Uh, and the goal is to, to support the decarbonization of the fashion industry in the, in the um, uh, worldwide, not only, not only in, um, in Europe. Um, then to, to conclude this aspect uh, between the difference between of, of the slow innovation and the fast and the fast in, innovation they all operate in different contexts uh, while the fast uh, uh, fast innovation operates in this fast environment so the fast is present across a number of sectors of the society that helps this this fast economic development process to occur uh, to occur and still and still uh, uh, present uh, very very intensively in our in our economic system or in our, the organization of the the economic landscape, the slow innovators, the slow innovation process is coming is coming through uh, in the, in the, in some countries in the, in Europe, uh, and I the present idea is again is that the 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 principle behind in support of this slow innovation is uh, uh, focus on lasting long knowledge producing lasting long products and, and sustain, have a sustainable way of production, not responding to the market, but, but enhancing local, uh, local resources and local uh, knowledge. Um, and now the challenge is also how to scale up this slow innovation from, from a specific sector, such as the fashion, to other type, uh, uh, to other sectors of, uh, of the society. And um, we'll do now a, a 10 minutes break, I will see you around the three, uh, three five. And uh, for the second part of the lecture where we'll conclude slow innovation and we'll embrace the circular economy in conciliation with the slow innovation process. So I'll see you in um, about 10 minutes or so. All right. Uh... Back to the slide, and um, everything is running all right here. So I know that this may come as as very heavy uh, into the to the discussion that the, the why we are exploring slow innovation in this context. It's still uh, lacking a lot of case studies within slow innovation. It's still very difficult to find them. What is important that you take with you uh, as a take home message from the lecture is that the slow innovation relies on lasting longer uh, knowledge. And, uh, and in contrary to the urbanized areas, slow innovators as research calls or slow entrepreneurs, they rely less on frequent interactions. Uh, researchers suggest that they don't need, really need uh, as much interactions as the fast innovators, a way of classifying entrepreneurs in urban areas because the knowledge they exchange that can support innovation within industrial processes, process, for example, tends to be, be more solid, more lasting longer, uh, and um, and not responding to specific trends as opposed to fast environments where the number of useless knowledge and is coming from the literature where, the, where, where number of false information tends to also uh, uh, be underpinned within these fast uh, development development processes and often attached to it is the the aim of profit making and the aim of profit making more than the aim of supporting a, a, a sustainable development um, is the engine of the fast movement and uh, the hypothesis that this slow innovation if is undertaken as a as a consolidated policy in regional development, for example, can support this transformation of the economic landscape of the economic system uh, towards a renewed system that supports, in a strategic manner, sustainability. That's why uh, that's why is explored by regional geographers, uh, mainly those that are more concerned in exploring a renewed industrial path. 
so a type of industry that embraces uh, uh, less uh, damaging to the environment uh, ways of production and uh, and the usage of um, of resources another component is that in in uh, peripheral territories in uh, non urbanized territories uh, because of this slower pace of embracing the day-to-day -day life tends to support more creative processes it, it is of course depends depends of of the way people behaves some of us we are probably probably more uh, or we feel more comfortable with urbanized the environment so we tend to be creative in such environments. Others, they prefer more calm, relaxing, at relaxing atmospheres. And then part of the research also tends to focus on how these peripheral uh, uh, territories, they support this creativity process that can then uh, influence the creation of the, or the co-creation of new industrial paths, or even lead to the exploration of certain niche markets within a specific domain, such as, for example, the garment industry. The examples around us, they are more related with uh, innovation within the health section, so kind of, of ways of uh, of dealing with cert certain illnesses, for example, through more uh, through more therapeutical processes, and another one is uh, uh, regarding the textile and um, the textile sector, or more regarding the overall garment industry, uh, and mainly uh, those that are focused on producing uh, equipments that for a specific activities, such as, for example, hiking uh, or, or mountain bicycle, for example. And uh, the, the companies here in this regarding uh, more, more commonly, uh, commonly debated within slow innovation and also circular economy is, for example, Patagonia within the garment industry as one of the of the uh, of, of the enterprises that are investing more on this slow innovation process is not necessarily by being located in the peripheral regions, but by investing in products that last longer in the market. They are they want to position themselves not as as responding to a market trend, not responding to a hashtag on social media, but to responding to the consumer that wants a safer, a more resistant products that's how their business model works and then we can then uh, identify somehow a process of slow innovation within their business model the challenge here is to adapt current mainstream business models oriented for profit towards business models that can still uh, be uh, economically uh, uh, um, economically uh, productive and uh, and have also a lower environmental footprint stills a lot of a lot of developments in this in this regarding so uh, other components tells that this slow innovation process is a way to overcome this this negative depreciation of these uh, peripheral areas uh, calling them lagging regions as i said before attached to them some sort of uh, negative meaning as a depressing places yet uh, yet research shows that they still have a potential to explore their own resources in a more slow pace manner and eventually contribute or have a higher impact in towards social and uh, environmental sustainability because they can involve more local knowledge, young population, and eventually even contract uh, migration patterns that occur uh, quite dramatically uh, between uh, rural areas towards urbanized, uh, urbanized environments. Um, I bring next a couple of examples more how this slow innovation takes shape within towns and i ask if you ever if you like to intervene at this stage if something is is unclear here in this in this context i have a question um do you maybe yeah. have an example for a slow innovation project company something like that in a rural area that really evolved into a industrial yeah. cluster or into really a successful yeah um area for uh -huh. businesses enterprises organizations stuff like that mm -hmm. well indeed uh, thank you is, is, a, is a good question the examples are not that many at at this stage there's the uh only um 
the examples I know is the one that exploited by some of your colleagues earlier. Patagonia embraces slow innovation partly, but then it's an enterprise, it's difficult to grasp in terms of the location. Uh, Latvia embraced an approach towards slow tourism, so they, they want to attract tourists that like to enjoy local areas in, in, a, in a, again, in, in a manner that that benefits the local communities greatly because they stay longer time, they explore in a slow pace. And there are a number of case studies, uh, yet I still have to explore them. I can bring them to the next lecture, actually, uh, within uh, Slovenia and Switzerland because uh, Hank Meyer is a, the main researcher conducting research within slow innovation in rural or peripheral areas. They have been... Um, uh, uh, doing this research in Switzerland and uh, parts of, of Slovenia. Um, and there, there are a number of uh, in, in industries in these peripheral areas that they can be associated or, or, or can be placed within a cluster of uh, watchmaking, essentially. Uh, others within um, agricultural products, they seek some specialization within agricultural products. Uh, but then still a lot of research needs to be done in this in this regard and finding examples is really challenging there are examples more related with this slow food slow city uh, or, or exploration of uh, agriculture uh, uh, products that somehow are aligned with the principles of slow innovation i can uh, focus on the, what uh, hank meyer is currently doing in Switzerland and Slovenia, see if they have actually uh, uh, an example of, a, of an industrial activity and where exactly is located so we can understand, we can grasp better this innovation process. Okay, thank you. Okay. So the examples I have here next, they are somehow more general and the challenge for, for us. And if you like this concept of slow innovation and would like to explore it later on, is really finding a, a case study. So I'm, not, I'm also not expecting you to, to conduct primary research, but rely essentially on the, on the literature. But it's still very challenging to find these examples. And the examples that, uh, uh, that, that is possible to find, they are more related with the uh, with a with a slow food movement that it emerged earlier than the slow innovation process in the sense of influencing innovation processes and this slow food movement is then associated with a slow city movement uh, and but exam examples in concrete are also not that uh, that that great in um, in um, in bringing the, the examples in um, in concrete and uh, and uh, with the city the slow city and the slow food slow city movement they, they, the idea is to conciliate the environment, the economy, and equity. So that is to rely, again, on local resources to support the economy while uh, being uh, uh, environmental, uh, environmental sustainable. And ideal, ideal uh, in, the, in the working, you know, by embracing the full principles of slow food and slow city uh, and, and bringing these principles towards the development agenda of our territories, that they can support uh, sustainability transitions. Basically, that's the overall goal of bringing the concept of slow innovation and slow innovation within the the slower uh, the the slow food movement is about emphasizing the farmers' markets that some of us uh, have in our in our uh, uh, in our cities uh, is about eating local uh, is about fair trade means that 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 uh, a way of uh, trading uh, um, commodity crops in the way that. Uh, that benefits the local communities and, and but all of this what i point out requires some uh, critical thinking so there are different approaches enhancing how consumers can have a more a more a more uh, localized approach to their to their diet uh, but it's still uh, for us to to truly trust on this kind of branding uh, uh, is important to 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 disentangle the greenwashing effect and understanding if if, if uh, those that are transmitting themselves as being, for example, a local product or a bio product that aligns with the principles of slow food, slow exploration of agricultural activities, if they are really truly communicating uh, um, their uh, their uh, their engagement with the uh, with the sustainability. So it's important to have all these critical 
assessment in this regarding. Um, there are a number of few examples trying to to uh, to shape policy in the way that uh, emphasizes the local production, so emphasizes uh, local resources in the in the less uh, less fast uh, fast process. Uh, the examples I bring one is from the European Union, but is yet uh, to be determined the truly impact of the farm to fork strategy. So a strategy that that the prime goal is to enhance the local production. Uh, and the uh, Vancouver uh, food strategy is one of the few urban regions worldwide. Again, it is underlines the difficulties of finding case studies, uh, underlining uh, is, is an urban region with a food with a food strategy. And the aim is to minimize the negative impacts of having this globalized supply chains involving agriculture, uh, agriculture uh, 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 crops such as uh, avocado, for example. Um, there are also a number of uh, of um, of calls to support more localized agriculture production coming from the world food world food program um other examples of the slow innovation in smaller places in the peripheral places uh, the more consolidated one is the so called eco municipalities in um, in the, in sweden uh, also the process of uh, of uh, slow cities and related process of slow innovation and slow food emerged actually in the United in the United States with a, with a, uh, with a, and now this this movement of the smaller of the uh, slow city communities actually emerged in a more consolidated manner and they have their own plans to reduce for example carbon carbon emissions so some of these processes they start small and through this governance arrangements, new institutions, such as this, the National Association of Swedish Eco Municipalities, they uh, have now a higher emphasis in the, in the organization of the, of the society, of the society in general. The examples uh, that is possible to find is about these localized interventions in smaller, uh, in smaller uh, uh, territories, in rural areas. They are more involving uh, uh, energy energy production for example not necessarily these, these the examples they are not this 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 like beautiful examples of a, an innovation so the, the the use of this system of uh, energy production comes from elsewhere they have just been applied in smaller in a, in a peripheral 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 regions uh, yet a lot of research needs to be done to understand the extent uh, other type of, of innovation process can really lead to an increase, uh, for example, in terms of job offers and support the economic activity of these smaller uh, smaller places. Another one is the application of uh, solar panels in the, to support the, the agriculture production as a number of examples in Germany and in the Nordic, uh, in the Nordic countries. And um, I have, uh, as a sort of, as, as a sort of, uh, of a summary, uh, this concept of slow innovation again emerged as a, as a response to this uh, to the prevalence of, of urban bias within innovation studies. So a number, a lots of innovation studies, more mostly focus on innovation processes in urbanized environments, envi uh, urbanized, uh, urbanized environments. And the key characteristic of the slow innovation process is that it requires less frequent interactions in comparison to the uh, to the fast movement, relies more on slow decade knowledge, knowledge that lasts longer, uh, and the engagements between uh, that's called stakeholders between innovators and between, maybe between innovators and other experts is that they don't need to meet that often. When they meet, they meet in a strategic manner and what they exchange in terms of 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 knowledge of dealing with processes or or dealing with the, the capability of exploring some specific resources when they do they do it in a very strategic manner in the way that that they can advance very uh, they advance very swiftly not necessarily quickly but uh, advancing advancing in a consolidated manner that in few steps they can reach uh, uh, can reach or can improve a production process uh, and uh, and uh, instead of uh, it is in opposition of what's happened in the more urbanized landscapes where they tend to 
meet often and tend to respond as fast as possible to the to the economic uh, to the economic sector or to the market to the market needs. What is important to understand for us as uh, uh, researchers is is the extent of this is to what extent this slow innovation process or the one that we'll explore immediately after of circular economy can actually be put together within this discourse of sustainability transitions and understanding the kind of research questions that we can elaborate is understanding the extent is this um, this more alternative uh, uh, processes of economic organization can respond to the sustainability transitions, sustainable transitions call. And it's also important to understand the extent that this process evolve within specific, specific territories. And I think this is a, a concept that will, uh, will, will uh, receive a lot of attention from economic geographers, not necessarily putting it as a slow innovation, but I envisioning a lot of research taking place in these peripheral territories and understanding the extent they can uh, they can enhance that their resources, their, their local values, ways of uh, being these more physical resources or the ways are intangible, the ways of dealing with certain process, the extent they can contribute to this sustainability uh, transition uh, uh, player that is taking place across um, across the world. Um, so um, this is... Uh, um, the slow innovation process that appears in my assessment very much aligned with another uh, domain of, of contracting the mainstream economic, uh, economic system, that is the uh, circular economy. Quite popular these days, still rather controversial. And I guess in this slide, uh, basically this slide tells you everything you need to know about the circular economy. The important for us as researchers is to understand, okay, how to get there, uh, understanding if uh, the private sector, if they are really open to engage with such a kind of process, how this circular economy process uh, can actually take a shape in a realistic sense when the fast innovation process, it's still dominating most of the innovation policies globally. So the circular process uh, opposes to the linear one of simply using the raw material, the resources, having uh, uh, the production of a specific product, that this product will be, uh, will enter the consumption uh, uh, consumption domain and then will turn into waste. Then the circular one is following this linear process, but the number of cycles where the product, instead of going from production consumption to waste, can be reused, repaired, and re-enter the consumption arena, as, as it shows here. Um, examples are here more vast than the slow innovation process. It's also slightly more easier to, to grasp and the number of strategies supporting circular economy, they are also uh, um, uh, more applied uh, uh, worldwide in comparison to the, to the slow innovation policy domain in this, in this context. So I will go through the the, the circular economy, but uh, it's important that uh, that I ask you if you would like to intervene at this uh, at this stage for some for some issue less clear. All right, most of the research in this uh, circular economy uh, at the moment, in my perspective, it still is lacking uh, uh, lacking uh, uh, concrete. Uh, or practice oriented examples and uh, and uh, some of the, the the literature still trying to understand what's the truly meaning of circular economy uh, because they, they argue that what, what how the circular economy is currently defined is very much simply any simply an extrapolation of how the society actually should behave uh, uh, and and then that that's that is they underline that is nothing really new about circular economy just the way that the market starts that that the, the, the economic organization starts reacting more to the market turn it in the linear process rather than a circular one that used it to be so the prime idea of the circular economy is bringing the economic domain more closer to nature so and having this 
harmonic or the symbiosis between the the economic and the nature or the environment if you will uh, within a, within a specific society and the idea of the circular economy more than going from reuse repair is 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 the, the or the philosophical principle is having is having this harmonization between society and um, and um, and nature so Again, we need this evolutionary perspective to understand how the concept came to be, and 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 and, and, and all of this is somehow the reaction or it, it, the 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 way researchers deal with the concepts and influence the policy. As I've been underlying this before, so circular economy. What some of the researchers underline is that it has been around for many years, and it just received a little push recently. Uh, because a number of researchers start to, ex to to exploring ways of again responding to the needs of uh, embracing a more sustainable patterns of development, and they start to explore okay how we can do this. Let's 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 uh, understanding some some what are the concepts that can better uh, help us to grasp this relationship between society and where we place the economy and um, and the nature. And also the concept, the concepts start to evolving, and then to the point that influencing some of the policies that influence these days the distribution of, for example, of some financial package from the from the European Union. And um, the 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 popular uh, and the hot topic these days is the European the discussions are the discussions around the European Green Deal, and the European Green Deal entails a circular economy action plan. So probably maybe. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, this concept wouldn't be called the circular economy, but maybe the principles of it, they were already attached to the, to the regional policy of the, of the European Union. It's just then because it also is important to, to, to engage the stakeholders and speak the language they, that is closer to them. Uh, so the concept of circular economy also entered the policy discourse in Europe and elsewhere, uh, and well elsewhere in, in the world. And then the Helen MacArthur Foundation is the foundation uh, that pushing forward the, the circular economy approach and tries to 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 engage with different uh, different institutions worldwide to truly uh, bring a circular economy into the political discourse on the economic uh, or into the uh, economic policies there are a number of other concepts uh, that probably would respond better to the need of making the balance between the the economics economic activities and the sustainability uh, and sustainability but then this such as the foundational economy uh, but these are still is still is still taking time for them to to uh, to enter a more a more common common uh, uh, common discourse within policy and uh, and research, and then what is important to underline here is that the definition of a circular economy. There is one. There is no single definition of circular economy. It very much depends of who is defining it, and and here I prefer to focus on the definition, which is quite recent actually from the European Commission. So let's see how they define a circular economy. They define it as a production and consumption model, which involves reusing, repairing, refurbishing, and recycling. Yeah, it's very easy to say, and then certainly very easy to do, and it involves what we have been talking. About about earlier it involves governance it involves public and private actors and it involves also ourselves yeah and understanding if we are willing to repair our goods our products or if we prefer to embrace this fast process and follow the market trends and then having a completely new one so is it certainly nice to have such a definition and it's interesting to see uh policies taking shape around the circular economy concept, but it's certainly very difficult to implement in practice. So this is about reusing, repairing, refurbishing, recycling, existing materials and products, and keep the materials within the economy wherever possible. Uh, and for the long, for the for, for the longest time possible. That's the essence of entering a circular economy instead of, of keep producing and feeding the market and continue the, uh, this accelerated type 
uh, of, uh, of production, having a more slower pace of production where products are actually then repaired and can be refurbished and reutilized over and over again. This, that's the only way we can we can make the, the the production process within economies more sustainable a number of diagrams explains or makes the difference between the linear going from the production the distribution process the consumption to the waste and the circular one that that there are a number of of uh, sub steps until a product is finally the wasted and ideal uh, within the circular economy principle a product will never be will never be fully wasted because we'll suffer some some refurbishment will suffer will enter will be recycled or repaired and will enter the consumption process again eventually will be shared and let me jump over the over this this more conceptualized definitions on the advantage of the circular economy that you can then see if i can up uh, then then the uh, zero waste city. I may go back again because I want to reach the the some of the examples here before the time runs out. So again, it, it's still still difficult to find the concrete examples on this circular circular economy and uh, and how difference the, the difference between the linear and the circular economy. For those studying regional planning and regional development, the zero waste city approach embraces these principles of the circular economy within the planification and development of the territory where this zero waste city is, is applied. And the idea is precisely to reach a zero landfill, for example, in terms of a, in terms of waste, in terms of waste management, enter a number of domains that they go from the consumption to the industrial production, and it also requires a number of changes in terms of legislation to truly achieve the zero waste city. So governance is essential question, even if we are talking about slow innovation processes that require mostly or or essentially the involvement of private actors policies are necessary to truly implement circular economy we need to be involved as the consumers but we also need to have the facilities to recycle we also need to have the facilities to 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 repair our 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 mobile phones our laptops etc so a number of structures maybe new institutions uh, new services that need to emerge in support of slow innovation or circular economy disentangle all of this is certainly very uh, very challenging and of course business models uh, while the private sector will still relying heavily on the mainstream business models it will certainly be, be very challenging to um, to uh, embrace slow innovation or circular economy there are a number of examples of circular business models uh, and um, uh, number of examples, a number of research, and they still lacking uh, concrete examples in these um, in these domains. Interesting to underline is that some of these circular economy uh, um, calls they have been integrated in larger plans. So I see this with a positive movement of of uh, uh, positive governance arrangement trying to bring these principles of the circular economy to the overarching planification of territories. So uh, some of them, they are more sectorial plans, others, uh, others they are both spatial, so they target, uh, for example, uh, services regarding with waste management, but they conciliate or try to conciliate also with them, how the private sector within that specific territory can behave in a more sustainable manner through circular uh, economy. Okay, a couple of examples here in the next uh, in the next slides between standard business models and the circular business models. Uh, so within circular uh, economy, within this uh, reusing, refurbishing, uh, recycling, it's possible to find then then uh, that, and sharing as well uh, a number of examples in this in how some of the companies are doing it. We can also very critically. Uh, we can uh, we can consider Airbnb as part of this, or, or, or aligning uh, their business model with the sustain with the circular economy principles as they support this exchange of uh, rental space. Uh, yet very controversial when it comes to uh, to 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 um, 
to, to the development of uh, of uh, of uh, this business model in uh, in in our urban regions as they are overtaking houses that they have could be could be used by local communities and some of the populations for example in historical neighborhoods of southern cities such as Porto or Lisbon they are they need to then to be relocated elsewhere because the historical city centers are being adapted to host Airbnb uh, business models. The British sugar converts waste and emissions deriving from its core sugar production into inputs for new product lines, for example, for animal feed. So, so the waste is used for something else. So, so there's also a, a share of, a, of a raw material in this regarding. Um, the Caterpillar uses a regenerate approach they they try they they rely heavily on the on the on the on the on the equipment and they try as much as 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 far as possible to repair their their uh, uh, equipments to continue uh, to enter this uh, continue uh, process and the miles try the, the the philosophical principle which can we consider aligning with the circular economy principle is to produce as lasting longer as possible washing machines, for example. Uh, and the, the essential element here, which is steels, as you may are aware, lacking in many others, is the capability of upgrading these equipments. It's another component that is essentially to embrace circular economies. To what extent we can influence business models to upgrade products instead of producing them from scratch. That's very, very important. Um, the Michelin, they also have a scheme for, for uh, sharing tires or, or kind of, of, of leasing uh, instead of purchasing the tires. And the, the customers, they at, at the end of the life cycle of the tires, they will give the tires back to be uh, recycled or refurbished when uh, possible. And the Philips of more advanced companies, they tend to embrace, uh, to, to optimize their production in different ways. And Philips embraces the share uh, domain, the optimization, and they try to, to uh, uh, keep their products in this loop for as long as possible within the, uh, within the production uh, process. Um, other type of, of business models within the circular economy. Uh, some of them, let me see, I can underline the car sharing one, so we can associate to a, to a, a, um, a more collaborative conception process. Uh, home sharing, certainly more controversial here and very difficult to, uh, to, uh, to uh, implement in practice. We can consider the, uh, the, the uh, streaming services as a way of dematerializing also the the, some some uh, uh, dematerializing services in general, uh, leasing and renting certainly this will uh, will be uh, will be circular business models that will enter the will enter the organization of the economic landscape more heavily in the years to come. Uh, uh, I want to believe in this uh, in this regarding, uh, but certainly a lot of research needs to be done on their truly potential and the impacts both positive. And negative, another, another, still the 3D printing eventually can contribute to reduce waste. Uh, also, certainly, it does not go without controversy and the need to, to explore this more in details. Uh, and all the services that essentially support support the reutilization and, 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 and helping certain products or service to stay in this loop without en entering the final life cycle of a product as long for as long as uh, as possible so some of, some of the research underlines that basically circular economy is this, is is about back to basics on how the society should behave uh, in a way that minimizes its impact upon the na upon nature and upon upon the, um, the environment um and here before uh, before the before the debate, so I have a number of, again uh, uh, another a couple of examples on how this circular economy is very much aligned with this call for sustainability uh, transitions and the, the elements that that uh, uh, that are important to how to get there. And again, this is all about uh, governance and bringing different actors together to work together towards a common goal of minimizing the impact of. Um, 
of, uh, of uh, production and consumption upon, uh, upon the society. And uh, around us, because we are in Europe, uh, we are, uh, uh, most of our activities are very much planned and organized uh, or directly and indirectly influenced by the European Union discourse. Uh, they, they have been embracing mostly circular economy, less slow innovation, although we can characterize slow innovation as a place-based approach. And within this Green Deal, as I mentioned before, the slow innovation, the circular economy, sorry, plays a fundamental role in helping to operationalize the Green Deal together with the component that is essential to me, that is the just transition and the just transition founding uh, that is essentially to support member states that are still lagging behind to enter the train uh, already in fast pace of sustainability transitions. So they have been uh, interestingly uh, in theory and uh, the, uh, embracing most of the, of the components we have been exploring in these lectures of sustainability transitions, reorganization of the economic landscape, um, place-based innovation approach where we can put place slow innovation, circular economy, and, and trying to minimize the negative impacts of the sustainability transition through specifically founding to support this transition. So it seems that they are moving in the right direction, yet it is necessary to, to wait a couple of more, of more probably years to truly understand the effectiveness of this European, European Green Deal. And I conclude then the lecture with uh, with uh, a number of uh, of uh, possible uh, possible research questions here, but they are all they are all calling you to be critical towards what we are witnessing, uh, even towards slow innovation, understanding the positive and negative aspects of all of these concepts, and uh, and I have my apologies if they are if they are coming to heavily coming to you heavily. Uh, these are some of the concepts and the call I leave to you is that to be to, to embrace this critical thinking towards these uh, ways of, of supporting sustainability uh, transitions. And again, it's important to underline the governance components of the sustainability transitions. To embrace circular economy, to embrace slow innovation, we certainly need the cooperation of different actors, uh, uh, public, private and uh, citizens. And um, before concluding uh, this, uh, this lecture on the circular economy and slow innovation, which paves the way for the next lecture on corporate social responsibility and the greenwashing effect, uh, I ask if you have uh, any questions. And if you have already an idea of a topic, even briefly, even two lines, just come to me via email and I will gladly reply as constructively as possible to your inquiry. Do you have any question at this stage? I have a, a question. I Gentlemen. wondered if you could make one or two comments about the, um, I don't know, the, the incentive uh, structures for um, transitioning uh, to say slower economies or, or a circular economy, how, mm. How, um, I, from our perspective, the, the incentives already there, we see the, uh, we begin to see some of the more extreme uh, impacts of climate change and that sort of thing. I mean, the, the need is clear, but, but in terms of working within this framework of, I don't know, uh, like um, stubborn uh, late capitalism, um, I, I've seen some examples of, of incentives like, like local currencies or, or I don't know if there, or, or some mechanisms to, um, to uh, you know, have producers incur some of the costs of of mm -hmm. uh, their their waste and that kind of thing. Um, do do you have any any sort of uh, I don't know uh, studies or or uh, yeah. key words maybe um, to to get to get one started down that path? You know, it's 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 certainly. Thank you for your question. It's certainly very relevant. And uh, yeah, I'm not fully aware of these more localized. Uh, more localized incentives to the slow innovation. I'd still, uh, in the overall, and based on the research I've been collecting, and uh, most of them they are the more, the most important are in your OLAT platform. Uh, they are still lagging behind in terms of truly uh, this financial supports or even 
other arrangements, not necessarily financial, to support slow innovation. Indeed, they rely, they, they, it's important to rely heavily on the private sector. But I, overall, and I having a, an overall answer here, I still think uh, uh, and, and based on the on, on the research I've been doing. Um, the incentives to truly support or the circular economy or slow innovation or, or other or more sustainable business models is still is still is still very few and a lot needs to be done in terms of policy in this regarding and in terms of involvement of the private sector to responsive responsibilize the private sector uh, regarding their own uh, activities it's something that i can look at while while I will be searching for some examples on the slow innovation, I will try also to understand what kind of incentives uh, these uh, these uh, entities or these territories, peripheral, are using to support this transition on the slow innovation. For example, this sounds very good. What you said about the low uh, the local currencies. Uh, what I'm more aware is that the local governance arrangements and i have examples from northern portugal where different municipalities uh, they are coming together to support innovation process that can uh, more than support the enterprises that are located there to be more environmental friendly is to support their economic sustainability so a number of municipalities together with uh, with universities uh, and going very much beyond administrative borders they are cooperating with each other and the number of uh, of these enterprises that are, they are innovating products they are innovating uh, and incorporating different technology in their products and incentives in this regarding is simply uh, not necessarily financial is is the incentives are the proximity between these entities and it's very much about what we talk about in a slow innovation the proximity and the the the, the a strong desire it's very much rooted in the identity of 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 boosting these uh, small uh, sub regions and place them uh, place them in in a more uh, place them among the developed uh, developed economies so there are no tangible incentives what exists is the the uh, the original identity that somehow incentivates public and private actors to come together and cooperate and support some sort of innovation. And they also rely heavily on the universities and research centers. And this also happens also, also everywhere and plays a role, the component that I actually forgot to mention. It can work as a very strong incentive, is the sense of belonging and identity. They certainly play a role in bringing to a higher level these slow innovation processes. Yeah, in fairness, like you, you mentioned the, the ethical incentives in the slow food um, movement um, and as well as that, the, I guess, the shame incentive as a, as a disruptor mechanism. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is certainly the, the, the ethical movement uh, in support of the slow food movement. And, and then here is the same question about how we can s scale up this these uh, local solutions that sometimes reveal to be very effective in terms of of uh, of social and environmental sustainability for example but how, how to scale up and uh, and also the issue of the shame is is certainly interesting is how to to maybe to do it or, or to play with it as a, as an incentive you mentioned here but in a way that that we don't enter any kind of conflict with private sector or, or with other public entities. Because when we are somehow imposing a behavior to the consumer, we are going against the democratic principle. And that's that's why I always try to underline, and sometimes maybe I neglect that myself while doing my own research is the critical thinking, uh, is, is, okay, I will use shame to shame the private sector, or I will use shame to the towards the consumers because they are not reducing their uh, meat consumption, but then I'm going against a democratical principle of freedom of expression, for example. So this is very difficult to find the right balance, but I'm also in favor in favor of, or um, I, I also acknowledge that such a balance is possible to be reached, but then there are synergies and trade-offs here. We mentioned this in the first, first or second lecture. And then I guess for everything, for, truly implement the circular economy on slow innovation, we need these trade-offs. We need a give and take. We need the private sector to 
be called upon their responsibilities, but we also need the public sector to come with policies that truly facilitate a circular economy. I really want to embrace circular economy and using my mobile phone as long as possible. But then I go to the shop and they tell me, okay, to repair your phone, you need 200 euros, but I'm using a, a low quality phone. It only costs me 100 euros, new one. So what shall I do? I repair and I pay 200 or I buy a new one for 100. So there's, there's something that is not playing well here. And finding the right balance is certainly very challenging and finding the incentives that are fair the European Union is trying to do that through the just founding scheme. Uh, it still is very doubtful if they will really be able to, to have this fair, as they call, equitable sustainability transition across the European Union my member states. Good. Good conversations here, I think. And um, all right, I think these are all interesting topics, different domains here to explore. And uh, I shared with you the, the uh, essays from last year for you to have, a, to have an idea of, uh, of, uh, of these, uh, the topics explored. And uh, as soon as you have some idea, again, come to me and then I will uh, try to help you the best, uh, the best I can and probably in a much more relaxed environment, environment that is one of the lecture where I come already from a long, from a long day since since 6 a.m. Uh, and it's not, it's, not, it's not that easy to come up with examples, but I will bring some examples on the slow innovation and incentives, mostly from uh, coming from Switzerland and Slovenia, where there is this uh, type of research is currently being, uh, um, being uh, undertaken. So, all right, I will conclude the lecture. Thank you so much for attending and uh, for watching this uh, uh, later on. And uh, so I wish you a rest uh, of a, a, a good rest of the week and uh, stay healthy. All right. So see you next week. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.